Today I have a special guest that I'd like to introduce to you, Dr. Robert Gamble. He's the executive director of This Child Here, a nonprofit ministry in Ukraine. And um, he has been back in the States ever since the war began. And so we're going to learn more about his his ministry in Ukraine and um, what's happening there right now and how we can help. So, Robert, thank you for coming. Glad to have you. Good to be here. Yeah. So what have you been doing in the States since you've gotten back? I've been traveling, speaking to churches, speaking to mission committees, groups of people that are interested in uh, what's going on in Ukraine and in particular what we are, what we are doing in Ukraine. Yeah. One thing somebody said um, was that now everybody knows, Americans know where Ukraine is. I mean, we didn't really know that yeah. five, six weeks ago. Yeah. But, but you've known about it for a long time. And so I would love to hear more about how you um, heard God's call to ministry in Ukraine and how you established this child here and the kind of work you're doing. So um, in the early 2000s, or 2000, um, I was doing trips to Nicaragua, mm-hmm. uh, taking young people to Nicaragua, a week of working in an orphanage, a week of surfing. At the same time, I started a uh, Hungarian worshiping community in Daytona Beach, because there's a lot of Hungarians there, and uh, went to Eastern Europe. And then I had a sabbatical in 2005, uh, when I was a pastor at the First Presbyterian Church of Daytona Beach. Got a sabbatical, and but before I went on it, I, I met a lawyer who said, if you want to help orphans, you should go to Ukraine. There's 80,000. So I decided on the sabbatical to go to Ukraine. And I was going to do the same thing with orphanages, but that's not what happened. What happened is I got there, and then... Uh, met people in a Ukrainian charity, a nonprofit, who were working with street kids. Hmm. And so instead of working with children in an orphanage, um, I began to see kids living on the street. So basically, kids were on the street in Ukraine and other parts of the former Soviet Union because the collapse of the Soviet Union was was in uh, 1990, Mm 89-90. And that was a horrific time for people in, in those regions. No jobs, no money, no food in the stores, and, but still alcohol, and there's a lot of abuse in homes. And those children who are abused at age one, two, three, four, five, you count 12 years later, and, the, and they are very difficult to manage. And they're on the streets, or they're in jail, or they're in an orphanage because their parents gave them away. And they haven't been in school then. Right, they weren't going to school. So we were working with street kids, and then we, we realized that they were coming from orphanages. And uh, so we began to work in orphanages, hmm. um, trying to build community for, with the children so that they would uh, not be tempted to go to the streets. They'd get their support from other kids that were there. And, um, and at the same time, we began to think about, could we train parents who would take these children from an orphanage, mm-hmm. foster parents? But then came a war. And when the war started, we began to work then with what we called IDPs, internally displaced families. We had camps for them in the summertime uh, for the whole families. We did that for four years after the war began. And, and then uh, we began working also with uh, foster families. And ironically, we were, we were getting trained to work with foster families in Moscow by really? yeah, lead psychologists there. So we had camps then uh, for foster families, the parents and children. Um, as well as doing training, we would offer uh, camps for them. So then our program was training foster families, uh, camps for foster families. We began work also with children who lived in indigent families around Odessa, single parent families that needed um, sometimes food and supplies, medicine, fr- uh, we, we would provide them with that, but also gave us a connection with them. And then last summer, we began to work with children of soldiers hmm. uh, who were suffering, uh, well, the family was suffering from a parent with PTSD. Um, so that, w- that was a good program, and I think that, obviously, 
we'll be doing a lot more of that yeah. in, the, in the months to come. So, so when you were on the sabbatical, did you say this is the rest of my life? I want to spend the rest of my life doing this? I mean. Yeah, I, I did. Um, and how much did. Russian did you speak? I didn't when speak you... any Russian at all. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I just started learning. Yeah. And then how, like how many kids are we talking about? How many, how many, how many, um, how many children do you think your ministry has really touched over the, the oh, th thousands of kids? Wow. Um, thousands of kids. Um, yeah. Through their, that were on the streets, that were in orphanages, now with foster families that we're, that we're working with. Yeah. Uh, so, Yeah. So it started with seeing a need, but there wasn't this master plan. You were just trying to meet one need at a time, and it just continued to grow. And we just we just began uh, evolving, and shifting, and 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 rearranging our priorities to try to get to the fo to the center of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and we kept going back and back until we were getting to the parents. And we began like right now. We just we feel like every child for every child a family, for yeah. every child a home. Mm -hmm. You can't raise a child in a facility. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They need that connection to an adult. If they don't have that, then they suffer from attachment disorders, all kinds of, of issues. And, and because um, there really wasn't a culture of foster care in Russia or Ukraine, it's been an uphill battle. But to get parents to step forward. But I think that, and I'm very hopeful that after this war is finished, that we might have a kind of renewed interest in, in those children. And taking them in. And taking them in. I know that there's gonna be a lot fewer houses for people to live in, mm -hmm. in certain cities, but I'm feeling like overall there might be um, a different environment. Mm. The, the conversations I have with people, the emails I get, are all about the connections between Ukrainians now. As one mm -hmm. friend of mine put it, we always had this place called Ukraine, and now we have a country of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now we have a country. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, we'll see. But I th that's, what, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Gosh, it's amazing. You have some pictures too, right? I, I do, and... Uh, so th there's pictures of uh, the f people that work for us, um, a number of images of, of staff people who work for us, and um, I have pictures of my trip to the war zone yeah. um, in December. And um, we have images also of uh, families that we are helping at this moment right now. Um, they come from across Ukraine to, to Ismael, where I was before I left, and uh, then they move on from there into Romania, mm -hmm. or they're staying there. Yeah. Like in Ismael, for example, the college dormitories are just full of families. Every hotel is full of families. Um, you know, hotel rooms. Because they've free. all been displaced. Yeah. 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 Now, nowadays, I mean, does your um, organization have enough of a reputation that people come to you? Or are you still going out trying to, I mean, maybe the war has changed all of that. You mean but in I'm America just or over in Ukraine? In the Ukraine. I'm Ukraine. wondering, like, how do you find the children to help? And how do you oh. get um, well, the foster okay. parents to be involved? Yeah. And how does that, how well, does that work? And maybe your staff does. Well, right now really we're not working with, with foster parents. We're focusing solely on refugees right now and people okay. who are yeah and people who are staying in spite of the war and sticking it out okay. so in both cases especially with refugees people have nothing and so we we're helping them yeah. they come to ismail they're in shock they lost all our stuff and we meet them we tell them it's going to be okay everything's going to be fine you got a place to stay now it's safe here we give them what they need so we that's where your staff is yeah now. right now we're doing okay. that kind of work yeah and a uh, leader of our staff over there is an advisor to the mayor in public relations. And so she's in touch with every time people arrive there, you know, and she has a, some volunteers that work with her 
to help do this kind of work with them. Yeah. So, uh, and there's things that aren't always available, like certain kinds of medicine, maybe. And we get some of this from Romania. It comes in. Um, or even a situation in Odessa where the uh, stores went out of cat and dog food. Mm -hmm. So I called a guy in Romania. Here's 400 bucks for cat and dog food. <laughs> you know, let's bring it in yeah. and we'll distribute it as we can. Yeah. But, um, so that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're looking ahead to working again with Foster Family, okay. but right now okay. we're focusing on the war. Right, right. And you are surprised, I guess, is that the right word, about the war? I mean, yeah. you, I mean you left fairly quickly. <clears throat> I mean, things So I left changed. the third day of the war. Yeah. Um, but I did not believe there would be an invasion. I, uh, right up until two days before, and here's what's interesting I find. So there's two lies. First lie is that Ukraine is run by Nazis mm -hmm. and full of Nazis. And the second lie is that uh, on the part of the Russian side, Putin, we have to invade Ukraine before they invade us. Right. So Ukraine That's and NATO- That's the story that they're telling. Yeah, yeah. Ukraine and NATO are gonna invade us, so we have to invade them first. Right. So you see how bo both of these lies come out of Putin because he's the one acting like a Nazi and he's the one who intends to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so he just takes that stuff and lays it on Ukraine. Mm. So, but the, the interesting thing is, I knew he was lying, but I didn't realize that he knew I knew he was lying. And what is, so what every time he said, Ukraine's full of Nazis, I said, come on, this is ridiculous. It's, this is a lie. And he knows I know that it's a lie. But this is the smoke screen that covers the real and unbelievable truth that from the beginning he intended to invade. Mm. So um, that's what happened. And, uh, but because, because he thinks that Ukraine belongs to the greater he, Russia? He, uh, okay, yes, he, he thinks that Ukraine belongs to, to Russia. He wants to go back to Catherine the Great or whenever Russia had mm -hmm. this, this territory. But um, the Soviet Union, interestingly enough, was interested in keeping these boundaries because they wanted a diverse population of people. They even encouraged Ukrainians to study Ukrainian language. Mm. They all took Russian, of course, but they wanted Ukraine, Georgia, Kazakhstan, all those to remain you know, satellites, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, of the Soviet Union. So they could you know, boast about this diverse population of people that they had. Yeah. So Khrushchev, uh, for those that know, gave Crimea to, to Ukraine when, uh, when, that, when the Soviet Union was, was, was uh, after the Second World War. Okay. Khrushchev was Ukrainian. I didn't know that. That's why he did it, you know. He gave Crimea to Ukraine. So Russia always felt like that was theirs, you know, from way back. Yeah. But it depends on where you want, when do you want to begin history? So uh, this is the, the question. But, um, you, but at the same time, many Russian people have in the past made fun of Ukrainians. There are farmers out in the field, mm -hmm. you know? Well, well, I think that just ended uh, with this, this war. Yeah. Um, so there's, yeah. Yeah. Now, how can, how can people help? Um, I know that, you know, our church in particular is, is um, has helped a little bit to to send some money um, to your organization, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, maybe you can let folks know, like if if they how they can send money and what that money is being spent on uh, at this point. Right. Yeah. So we have uh, we have two funds. One's called Give Number Two Ukraine, and every dollar that comes in on, on that uh, donate button on our website, for example, a hundred percent of that goes right to these families. Okay. Um, in terms of supplies we give them or sometimes cash that we give them to, for travel. So uh, that's where that goes. The other, the other button is for all of our other programs mm -hmm. and also keeps us running yeah. uh, during this. So it pays for the admin fees of that. And staff and all and, the yeah, support and all that right, kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so as far as other than giving, donating, I've had some conversations with people about what to do. Uh, two ideas thrown out. 
uh, actually three. One is to go on Etsy and buy art from Ukraine, digital art. Hmm. You can pay a Ukrainian person uh, who's done digital art, and they'll receive money for what they're doing. You can pay for- How do you find that though? You just type in- Go on Etsy, E-T-S-Y. Right, but you what type in Ukraine? Type in Ukraine. Okay, all right. Type in Ukraine, digital Mm -hmm. art. Okay. Let's see what you get. Support artists. You got, people are also uh, paying for a few days in an Airbnb and not going and just saying, let someone else stay there. Hmm. Another thing I've done is hire Ukrainians on Upwork um, to design website, do op- website optimization, uh, things like this. So it's another way. But the point is, is there some way that you can connect with a person in Ukraine? Mm-hmm. Because what I've discovered in the times that I've had somebody on the screen in, in Ukraine talking to Americans um, about what's going on over there, people in the States b- understand better what's happening. They, want, they like to see a person in Ukraine speaking. Yeah. They learn a lot from that. But what they don't understand is that that person looks out on a room full of Americans who are concerned about Ukraine. Mm. And that's huge, you know? Mm. Um, uh, we're not alone. Right. That we are not alone is, yeah. is big for people in Ukraine. Yeah. And so you're in touch with, I guess, every day with, with people back there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh. I, have, I have three women, one in Ismael and two in Odessa, and money goes right to them. This is an interesting way we transfer money over there. They have a bank card, and I use a thing called TransferWise, or it's called WISE, and uh, I send money to that card, and it goes into their bank account. And so I can send two thousand dollars. It gets there in thirty minutes. Wow, that's amazing. Whereas opposed to wiring money, it takes three days. Or lately, I sent a wire. Seven days went by, and they still hadn't gotten it. Yeah. So, um, so that's we move money that way, and that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Is there a difference between what's happening in Ismail and Odessa in terms of what you're able to do or what the needs are? Or are they well, so similar? Odessa is getting ready. Was getting ready for war. If you went on YouTube and you looked at um, just YouTube videos of Odessa, you'd see all these sandbags, you'd see all these people, you know, tank traps on the beaches, um, you know, a lot of that. Ismail doesn't have that much of that because they really aren't, don't feel like the Russians will come there. Mm -hmm. Um, So Ismail's getting ready, Odessa's getting ready for war. Um, They both have alarms that go off, sirens during the day one, two or three times a day, a siren will go off because some jet's coming near or because it's possible uh, of a rocket coming that way, whatever. I'm not sure what kicks off these sirens, but um, they each have that. So you got, if you look at Ukraine, um, the map, you see the the Black Sea down here, and you can start with Ismail, which is far enough west and Mm -hmm. south. Then three hours later by car, you get to Odessa. Then an Another two hours, you're in Nikolaev, where there's a heavy fighting going on right now. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, you'll end up fighting in Crimea, or Mariupol, and mm-hmm. then Crimea. Mm-hmm. So the Russians were coming this direction, but they could not get by Nikolaev mm. to get to Ukraine. And you know, to maintain supply lines, you can't just bypass you know, right. A, right. a city. You're gonna suffer. So yeah. they couldn't get past Nikolaev. And uh, that and some other factors, I'm not sure exactly, but um, just two days ago, we, I heard on the news that the generals in Ukraine were gonna focus on the east, which means they're leaving the west, hopefully. Hmm. But you never know what to believe. Yeah. You know? um, I was gonna ask, is there any semblance of normal life now? I, I guess that, that's an absurd question, but I'm wondering, like in Odessa and in Ismail, are there teachers teaching kids? Are they, are they going to school? or is it all just waiting? They're going to school online. Okay. Um, for example, today classes, university classes started in Kharkiv, a city that's been bombed you know, a lot. Um, I, know, I know teachers that today they start online classes with their so students, wherever their students are. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so this is one thing we think about. Can we, uh, do children have access to a laptop or, or a tablet so mm-hmm. they can um, go to school. And don't really know the answer to that question yet. I've already pr- 
proposed that to my people over there. Yeah. You, know, you know, what can we do about that? Um, and then another thing that's important to do, uh, we, we've started now uh, our therapy. I mean, we, we have places we can gather children, like in Ismael, and have art supplies, because in the time of trauma, this, is, this really works. Art therapy and play therapy mm. are really important. So there's an art therapy location near in the east, maybe uh, five kilometers from the war. Yeah. Where it's got kids in there and older adults, and it's full of easels and paints, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, kids often start with dark colors, and after a while they get brighter and brighter colors. Really? Yeah. There's ways you can see a difference. Yeah. And that's a whole nother field that I'm not really that up on, but I'm looking for people who know a lot about what do you, how to work with children who've been traumatized. I mean, mm. we've got kids here in the States who've been traumatized also, but yeah. maybe some of the same principles apply. Right, right. Uh, so our focus, our focus is on children. And to help children, sometimes you have to help the, help the families. It just, yeah, it grows. Uh, and you have to provide, like for parents, for example, the most important thing I think, because right now it's a mom and kids, okay? The dad's fighting the war. Mm -hmm. So adults can't, men can't leave the country. So you've got a situation where you have a mom and kids. Those mothers need to talk to each other and those kids need to be able to play in a safe place. Yeah. And it's just, it reminds me of when my kids were growing up in soccer. And all the adults are over here talking and their kids are playing on the, mm -hmm. on the field. Right. You know, if you can have a, a setup like that in a big tent or whatever it is, then you've, you've met two needs. One for children and then one for adults. Yeah, two support parents. system. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're a Presbyterian minister. Yeah. And um, you obviously see this as a ministry. I'm wondering, is there a spiritual component to the work that you're doing in Ukraine? So, I, I mean, are you talking about the gospel and, I no, mean, you're, you're, living, do, you're, you're living it, you're living we, it out. We don't certainly. do church, yeah. we don't do church. We, all our people are Christians that work for us, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we're, there's no need to tell Ukrainians how to be Christians, <laughs> how to run church, how to do church. Yeah. Um, so, our work is showing the love of Christ. Yeah. And well, if we're going to speak about love for just a minute, I'd like to tell you something that I've noticed um, that interests me. Um, so I was saying goodbye to somebody I, I love and care about before I stepped on the, on the barge to cross the river mm -hmm. to Romania. And um, I didn't feel sympathy for her. I felt respect. And I, th I, think, I think this is love. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm afraid for her life, but not because she's weak, but because she's brave. Mm. And then I realized soon after that, that that's how I feel about everybody in Ukraine. Not sympathy, but respect. Mm. And I fear for their lives, but not because they're weak, but because they are brave. Mm. And this is another way to express love. Yeah. Um, I think... And it, you know, I just began to ask myself, what, what am I thinking and feeling at this moment in which I'm about to leave Ukraine and my people are there? And I concluded that love makes war bearable. Hmm. It helps us bear the burden of war, whatever hmm. that burden consists of. Hmm. And war makes love precious. Hmm. You don't want to lose it. And you're so afraid that you might lose it hmm. in the loss of someone's life. Yeah. And I think that that's how, I mean, that's how I get through uh, and continue to do the work I do because the relationship I have with people in Ukraine, that motivates me. Um, and so it sustains me. And at the same time, I'm afraid for their lives. I haven't lost anybody yet, I know. Yeah. So uh, gratefully, but others, others have. And, um, 
And that's the way the Ukrainians are going to get through this. There's, a, there's this spirit among those people right now that wasn't there before. It's tragic that a war has to make that happen. But it's also happened, if you talk to people who know, with, with, uh, with NATO, with the European countries, they're all pulling together now. Yeah. Uh, where they're bickering and fighting before, right. all pulling together now. Yeah. Um, where do you... Where do you see signs of hope? I see signs of hope. Well, here's one. I was with a family last night. A seven-year-old boy just raised $5,238 to help in Ukraine. And he gave me the check last night. Oh, my gosh. $5,238. Yeah. He goes to church in Cartersville, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the pastor, Lee Jones, up there. Yeah. Um, I used to serve that church. I was an associate at Carter's I did not know that. Yeah, that was my first huh. church. My gosh. Yeah. Well. I just met Lee. Did you? A couple months ago, yeah. Well, um, she invited me to come. Well, there's a longer story, and I don't really know all about it, but this boy uh, started raising this money and then asked for a, a meeting with the pastor. My gosh. And uh, <laughs> when they came in, um, they said, do you know how we could give this money? It just so happened that she had just emailed me and I said, yeah, I'll come up to visit. And she said, oh, I know just the guy you can give it to. <laughs> oh, that's you know? great. So it was really nice to go up there and, and talk with them all about what, what goes on in Ukraine. So there is hope. I mean, that, that's a sign. I mean, that's on this yeah. side. Uh, and you see so many people are, that are concerned about uh, what's happening in Ukraine. And then in, on the Ukrainian side, the hope, a lot of the hope is that uh, people are supporting each other. Um, if you were to look at like the staff people that work for me, and I've got image of that, images of that, mm -hmm. they are the most committed people I've ever worked with. They're smart, they're committed, they care. Um, you couldn't ask for better people. They su support and sustain each other, mm -hmm. you know? Um, sit around and beanbag, beanbag chairs every month and talk about what they're doing and their problems and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and they're ex exceptional people and they're all women. They are all women. And maybe it's that culture that men don't want to do this kind of work uh, with children and families, but uh, I, I can't uh, be more impressed yeah. with, with what they do. Gosh. Um, so I'll tell you another story that's interesting to me. Um, I was in the East in December. I was with a Mennonite minister, and we were, we were driving around. We were giving supplies to what they call pensioners, mm -hmm. which is old adults that live right near the war. And they're not moving for two reasons. They're not moving because they don't have the money to move somewhere else to, to pay for an apartment and because they're too stubborn. Yeah. They're not going to move. So we go, we're going to visit them. And we were driving on a dirt road across a field. And on both sides are these little red signs that say mind. And the dirt road has got snow on it as well. And there's trees on one side and bushes on the other. And pretty soon we come across a tree that's been felled right across the road, so you can't get past. Mm. So we start backing up. We back up about 200 yards. And I was thinking maybe that we could have moved this tree ourselves or whatever, but then I thought, well, maybe it's, it's rigged. And there's a, oh. it's booby-trapped. Yeah. Because at that, in that particular place at night, people are traveling all around, soldiers are doing things. Okay. So we back up and we start going this way around the field. And then we take this other road on the other side of the field to cross over to get to the same place. And that's when I realized that the guy that put the tree there, he knows we're going to go this way and this way and this way. And that's when I've got my face this far from the windshield, looking at the dirt road in front of me to see any evidence that somebody dug it up and put a mine there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and honestly, for the first time, I was afraid. I was afraid. And all my old theories about peacemaking and reconciliation just disappeared in the fact, in face of the truth that you might die, mm. you know? Mm. And I, th you know, I think that th that's a reality that not a lot of Americans, unless they're soldiers, you know, uh, face. I've ever had to face, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, I know like my son's 17 and he and his friends are talking about the draft. The draft, like in America. Yeah, having to register with Selective Service, and they're watching. They're watching. 
and they're wondering if they're gonna, this is gonna escalate. Well, so the Romanians, um, when I got to Romania, yeah. they are terrified that they're next. Yeah. And that surprised me because they're part of NATO. I just didn't think that they would be that, that afraid, but they were very, are very afraid from the, everyone from the driver that took me to people I was staying with. Right. I mean, once you realize that Putin does the unthinkable, he, what's keeping him from doing the unthinkable again, right? Oh. Yeah. Anyway. And there's always some excuse why that land belongs to him. Yeah. No. It's really one man against the people of Ukraine. Not just the army of Ukraine, but the people of Ukraine. Mm. It's one man. It would, this would never happen without Putin. Yeah. So it's driven by that one guy. Yeah. Mm. Well, I am grateful that you are ministering to those people and that we can be partners in that ministry. And, um, and I, I will be praying for you and for the people that you left in the Ukraine and yeah. that, um, that through this time and through getting the word out that more and more people can learn about your ministry and more and more people yeah. can help and maybe some other seven-year-olds can raise over $5,000. He's yeah. an inspiration. Then, How yeah, can people... Yeah. Um, find you and keep up with the kind of things that you're doing. So if they'll go to thischildhere.org, it's a website. First page has places to donate, but also you scroll down. If you want to get a newsletter from mm -hmm. me with photos uh, of what we're doing, you can sign up for a newsletter. Just put your email address. There's a block down there to do that. And that's, that's, that's great because uh, I've got maybe 700 or so people on a newsletter right now. Yeah. But uh, you'll get stories and images of what we're doing right now. Great. Uh, any other social media that you Well, do? we are on Facebook um, as This Child Here and also Robert Gamble. You get uh, stories there too. Okay. On my, my particular Facebook page. But I, I'll, I'll, I put them on This Child Here's website or Facebook page also. All right, good. Yeah. Bob, thank you. Yeah, God you're bless. welcome. Thank yeah. you so much. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure.